Okay, yeah. Please find out from Rajesh. Is it okay to record? Yeah, yeah. He, he, he. Oh, record. We are not recording. We are putting it in YouTube, so it will be there. It will be there. Okay. So welcome everyone. So today we have a special uh, seminar by Professor Rajesh V Nair from IIT Ropal. So before I uh, introduce him, let me just again mention the few things that we usually mention in our online talk. So please uh, mute your mic because that will help us to reduce the background noise. Uh, next also, if you have questions, you can either write it in the chat box uh, here or in the YouTube chat box, we'll take it from there. Uh, and Rajesh, I will interrupt you in between uh, whenever there is a question. Okay. However, if you directly want to ask questions, whom, whoever is in the uh, Zoom, uh, you can just raise your hand and I will tell you that uh, you can ask the question. So, and the raise button is just in the participant uh, window. <coughs> there will be a green or blue button, something like that. It, it, will, it will be there. Good. So with this, let me introduce Professor Nair. So Professor Nair did his MSc uh, in uh, Kerala in MG University in 2002. After that, he moved to IIT Bombay and did his PhD with Professor Vijaya, who is not uh, uh, in Bombay right now. Uh, and uh, that he did in 2008. So he passed out in 2008. After that, Professor Nair moved to University of Twente in Netherlands where he did uh, a postdoc uh, from 2008 to 2010. Then he came back to Bombay, but to Park BRC, uh, where he spent some time and was working with Professor Jaktap, who is right now uh, a professor in IIT Bombay Physics. And then uh, after working uh, some time in uh, Bark, he moved to IIT uh, Roper in 2014, at, at, at the beginning of uh, 2014. And since then he has been there and he works in, in light transport in, and emission in photonic nanoarchitecture. And this is what he is going to talk about today. Thank you, Professor Nair, for joining us and giving this uh, talk and accepting our invitation. You can uh, start now. Yeah, you can uh, continue, Professor uh, Rajesh. Hello. Hello, yeah. is I'm audible? Yeah, now you are audible. You can start, yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, OK, thanks for the introduction and uh, also the invitation. Uh, so it's nice to be back to the campus, at least even virtually. So the last seminar I gave it to IIT Bombay, it was my PhD defense the way back in 2008. It's almost after 12 years and speaking to the department. So uh, I'll uh, give some, uh, some of our understanding, something what we learned in the last uh, uh, for five years at IIT Roper. So the title which I gave was the light transport and emission using a photonic nano architectures. So from order to tailored disorder. And uh, you see a picture which is, I'm sure everybody must have seen it at some point of your life, um, may, may, maybe noticed or not unnoticed, but uh, this shows very nice colors, right? And um, if you measure this um, uh, reflectivity from these kind of um, peacock feathers, you see that there is different colors is strongly reflecting. And this is one of the nice photonic uh, nano architectures which made in the nature. And so in my talk, I'm going to talk about these kind of systems which we make in the laboratory and, and see how we can study the light propagations and emission in these systems and maybe some possible new physics that we will try to understand. Okay, so before going to the, my talk, um, so I, as I, his, uh, Soumya said, I started my group in IIT Roper in 2014. Um, so primarily we do uh, under, try to understand the Sorry. I guess some audio problem is there. Yes, a little bit of audio issue. And uh, other system also we are interested where Rajesh, we about uh, sorry, we could not we could not hear you for one minute or so because there was some issue with the audio. Could you please repeat? So okay, so um, uh, so I started my research activities in IIT Roper in the beginning of 2014. 
and uh, the primarily we interested in uh, understanding the light transport and emission using uh, photonic structures. So the, one of the sample we use in our lab is uh, photonic crystals. And then we later we thought about moving to a disordered system where you don't have an order samples like here, but you have a completely disordered system. And but that has its own interesting thing. And we also work on the area of silicon nanowires. These are used for anti-reflections and some other optical functionalities. And other areas, some students are working on what we call as a 2D photonic monolayer, like atomic monolayer you have. So you have a 2D photonic monolayer and many natural like butterfly wing peacock feathers that also have their photonic nano structures in their body. So we are quite interested in these natural or bio photonic systems as well, which um, we are yet to get papers that it is with the referees, that's when it's missing here. And in the last two years, we started, ventured into a, a new area of research in the area of quantum photonics, which is using color centers in nano diamonds. And a couple of papers have been published from our group and, and uh, the, this is the first student working in that field. So I, in the end of the talk, I'll touch upon some of our um, um, views on the using color centers in nano diamonds. Okay. So as a background or a motivations, where does all this happens? Okay, so it's, it's quite long back story in uh, almost 130 years ago, 1887, uh, Lord Rayleigh published a paper in Philosophical Magazine where he is interested to understand why colors of uh, originate from something plates. Okay, so these are his language. So don't mind the language, the spellings are different. So we, he considered a laminated medium in which the mechanical properties are periodic. And uh, so the wavelength is approximately, approximately equal to the double the interval, that is lambda equal to two times d, if d is the interval. With the partial reflection from various lots will occur in phase. So it's something similar to what we call Bragg reflections. So individual thing will reflect very less light, but as a whole, the system give a very strong reflection of light. So even in 1887, the Rayleigh actually addressed it is possible to have frequency gap. When I say frequency gap, there are certain frequency which cannot propagate, rather it will be reflect back. And from 1887, in 1934, from India itself, uh, Professor C.V. Raman has written a couple of papers to the proceedings of Indian Academy of Science. So he's also interested why certain seashells show some nice sparkling colors and he also considered the pros possibly due to the laminated structure of the substance. And another paper, he was quite interested to find out why certain birds uh, show different nice colors. And when they turn around, the color changes. So he classified colors into two iridescent type, which is the color which change with the angle. And there are non iridescent class. And that means the color does not change with any angle. For example, the parrot, if you look at you always a green color. But there are certain birds like peacock, uh, peacock, when it rotate, you see different colors. So maybe that time it was not that if you read the paper, it was there's no much graph for anything, but it is like a storytelling that he was also quite interested why these colors are happening. And there wasn't some idea that yes, it is because of some structure induced uh, colors. Then in 1970s, the same system proposed from Russia as a, in, a, in a very different perspective, like how to control spontaneous emission just after the invention of lasers. So maybe if you look at the many books, we, can, we see that the spontaneous emission is something which cannot be controlled, or it's an entity which the nature want to be like that. But then there was a paper written in 70s uh, by Baiko, which is not that cited in the modern optics. Actually, he talked about the same laminated structure. Now the, he called periodic structure, so the same meaning laminated structure where we can use to control the spontaneous emissions. And in 81, Daniel Kepner from MIT came up with the same idea in a slightly different way. Okay, rather than have a laminated structure, you also have a defect in a laminated structure. So we call like a cavity kind of system in the photonic structures. And, but still the people of the paper did not get much attention or citations. But in 1987, in the issue of physical letters, the same issue of PRL, the two papers published together. One is by Eli Abnonovich, where he said that in, he, you consider the laminated medium not only in one dimensions. You consider the laminated medium in three dimensions. So if a three-dimensionally periodic structure has an electro, electromagnetic band gap that overlap with the electronic bandit, the spontaneous emission can be rigorously forbidden. 
and i think this is the highest cited paper in pr and more than i think now 20000 i'm sure and the same issue people also sajeev john came up with an idea the same structure can also be used to localize photons similar to the anderson localization of electrons so with these two papers which came in a kind of a technological point of view like how to control spontaneous emission so that one can have a low threshold lasers this field got very much interest that's why the previous paper did not get much attention even it's quite rare people see that thing but all the credit went up to these two guys they proposed that is actually the same idea what raman or really looked at but they looked at in more in a technologically level in three dimensional space so after that um, uh, let me move a bit more technical that uh, what we what we mean by the structure and what exactly happened so if you consider a photonic structure which consists of two dielectric constant epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 which is periodically arranged in one direction for example let's take the uh, the one direction for simplicity so you have certain periods and the wave equations which we study in the griffith book which will take up this form where dielectric constant is a function of space okay so when you have this dielectric constant function of space and when you send certain um, see there will be the strong reflection reflection from the system which actually give a very strong back reflections so uh, so we say okay there is a frequency gap or there is a photonic stop gap okay and if you look at the dispersion relation which is omega versus wave vector for a light in free space you have the straight line which is a green dotted line here and if you look at the dispersion relation in this kind of stratified or a laminated structure what you have is that similar to the condensed matter samples we have some kind of a frequency gap and that occur at pi by a which is where the, the edge of the balloon zone happens so the if you launch frequency in this yellow band to these kind of structures you get a strong back reflections that means the light cannot penetrate and if you look at the field of the light propagating at these frequencies you can see that it has an exponential decay into the structure so if the light is not reflected totally at the surface it actually propagate inside and there will be constructive interference in the backward directions okay so we use some numbers in my talk and in our community which we call a bragg length which is the distance at which the light propagate inside the sample and in the literature people misinterpret this as band gap for light or a photonic band gap which is not correct this is simply a direction dependent gap which is can be changed with the angle which can change with even polarization of light okay so so this is the essential physics to be very simplify understand that we consider a system which has a periodic dielectric constant i can have this periodicity in one direction two direction or in three dimensions because it's artificially made systems so we have the freedom to choose the according to our need so why this structure got very much interest right if you look at it especially people working on condensed matter physics they may think that we know all these thing in electronics or electronic system where the back reflections and you change the lattice constant you get into optical domain why that's why the paper by yablovich got more interest than other papers and this was his idea you take a structure a periodic structure which has a dielectric constant variation at the optical wavelength scale and you will say assume that this is a three dimensional structure and you send light from outside as i said in my last slide the light get reflected because i satisfy the bragg diffraction condition so whatever angle i propagate the light i cannot get light into the structure so yablovich thought instead of doing this why not keep a source inside okay so let's keep a bulb inside which emit light at these diffraction frequencies that's why i use the same color and you give some energy it get excited and there will be spontaneous emission of light now the light which propagate from inside the sample to the outside medium it will also encounter this periodicity and since i intentionally made my light source wavelength is exactly equal to the band, gap wavelength it get internal bragg reflection and in a way basically i'm stopping i'm i'm stopping the light to emit so this was the idea which yablovich uh, proposed in his uh, famous paper and that's why it got a lot of interest in the modern uh, optics or in photonics industry because now you have a platform where you can control the spontaneous emission so philosophically people call a photonic band gap or a photonic gap 
is an island of tranquility in a fluctuating vacuum, right? We have a we have nearly zero spontaneous emission, theoretically speaking. And if you look at the density of state for these kind of samples, for a homogeneous medium, you have the green dotted line, which has an omega score dependence. Whereas if you have the density of states for a photonic- so, uh, Rajesh, there is a question. Yeah. So the question you can read in the chat box, but let me uh, read it anyway. Can we differentiate for light reflected between particle and between interlayer? No, because these are on micron scale periodicity. It's like a layer by layer structure. Okay. Let's continue. Yeah. Okay. So if you look at the density of state for the system, the red line, as you see here, at the gap, you have theoretically a zero density of states. And from the Fermi golden rules, Fermi's golden rule from the time dependent perturbation theory, the rate of spontaneous emission is proportional to the density of the states, which is represented by rho omega. And in a photonic crystal, you can control this density of states for the density of photon states for the given emitter. So when you can control the density of states, you can get control the decay rate and you can control the spontaneous emission. So this was the whole idea behind the uh, photonic crystal business and why that was quite interesting, especially technologically, because you can control and uh, the emission of light the way you want. Okay. So, so it was proposed in 90s and then a um, lot of theoretical works happened. And experimentally, the field got a lot of momentum, especially in the last two decades, where how do you make the structure, right? It's like, imagine you want to make a crystal, you are keeping one atom by another by your machine or by your hand. So it's, it's that complicated and it's difficult. So for an experimentalist, what is important is high refractive index contrast. As I said, it is a periodic variation of dielectric con contrast. So we need maximal difference to have a maximal light matter interactions and with the minimal optical absorption. So refractive index, we can't have arbitrary values because there is a nature put a um, tag on that. Maximum we can have silicon 3.5 at near infrared. And the most important thing is the perfect ordering as we have to make it as artificial. So people used many techniques around the globe. So one of the techniques is semiconductor fabrication like um, EB lithography, reactive enhancing such uh, techniques, and they make very nice periodically structured uh, crystals, which is this, the one you see is one of the famous system, which actually shown a signature of the photonic band gap, okay? So if you look at the band structure here for this structure, you can see that the frequency versus different directions in your Beloyne zone, you can see that there are a region of frequency range where there is no states. So at any symmetry direction, you have a gap, so we can have this structure as a photonic band gap system. And there is another technique people also use laser writing or uh, interference lithography, where people try to make the structure, but the structures look very nice, but optically these are not that good quality. The other famous method which people use, which I will also talk uh, quite detail, is a self-assembly of microspheres. So the chemistry is mastered in making these kind of um, sub-micron particles which uh, we can buy even commercially. And uh, there are techniques to make these samples. So these are the samples which we made in our lab. So you can see the photo, the light, if you shine a light, it strongly reflect back to you. And if you slightly tilt it, it will show you a different color, okay? These are two different samples, but this is image is taken at a tilt angle, okay? So, but the problem with the self-assembly is that we have no control on the process. It happens by itself. And the available microsphere materials are limited. So you can't have silicon or very high index contrast, but you have a low index contrast. But uh, since the method is easy and it's, you can make a large area, it's not uh, expensive. So most of the people follow these techniques to make these samples. It won't give the effect like a silicon system like this, but it indeed gives some physics, some understanding about what is possible if one can make this kind of stuff. So um, we made these samples in our IIT Roper, and we can see the, the image of one of the samples. And you can see that how these are nicely ordered. And there is a big crack. I intentionally show this picture because um, one should not go with an idea that it's all perfect. There are a lot of defects. There are a lot of cracks only happen. And uh, for uh, these are all create a lot of problems when you do the optical experiments. So if you sent, once you made the sample and once you uh, launch the light, uh, as of, um, and measure the reflectivity. So here you're measuring the reflectivity as a function of wavelength, okay? So you shine the light on the sample at different wavelengths 
and you measure uh, what is the reflected light. And you can see that it gives zero reflection for these wavelengths and it starts increasing and reach a high value at somewhere around 600 nanometer. And again, it falls down and goes like a homogeneous thing. And if you simultaneously measure the transmission, which is with the dotted line, you can see that the transmission started uh, at around 40%, it's very less because it's too much scattering uh, by the, these kind of disorders. So you get a zero transmission where you get a high reflection peak. So we call the light at around 600 nanometer, which cannot propagate into the system. And this we call as a photonic stop gap. And this stop gap is direction dependent. If I change the angle of incidence, because it's a Bragg diffraction change, and it is all since it is we are doing with the light, it also matters the polarization of light. So it may show you one polarization, it may not show for other polarizations. So these things are quite well studied in literature. We also did a lot of work on this uh, some time back. And one of the things uh, which I will keep in my talk is the thickness of the sample, which we measured by using this fabric perot kind of fringes, using this formula. And the light, the Bragg length, which is the length of the attenuation of light at 600 nanometer into the sample by this formula, which we call as a Bragg length. Because we use this parameter, which is L by LB, as a number which to quantify the um, finite size of the system. Okay. And um, so we, this also show like in atomic crystals where the multiple Bragg diffraction, two wave diffraction, three wave diffractions, such process in optical. One can see with your eyes in this system. Okay, so then what we do, we, we try to do emission experiments, uh, like what we have with suggested. Instead of looking at from outside, we grow the sample and uh, with the scatters, this kind of microspheres, which is polystyrene microspheres. Sorry, Rajesh, there is another question. Yeah. So why are the fringes on one side of the peak? Because that is the long wavelength limit, and um, that will be it is slightly more better, but you also get the fringes in the lower one also. Nice. Okay. Yeah. And um, uh, so we did, uh, we grow sample with the rhodamine B as the emitter. And so this dye is now inside the sample. And uh, so you can see that the, the pink symbols are the dye emission spectra. And these uh, lines, solid lines are the stop gap. You can see that as you increase the angle, it shifts to the shorter wavelength. So you can see that the dye emission, which is the pink symbols here, is matching with my gap at 10 degree, 20 degree, and partially at 30 degree. So I should get a suppression in spontaneous emission at these angles. So we did a very simple experiment, quite long, maybe in 2015 or something. So we just put the sample and collect the excite with the 532 nanometer laser and we collect the spontaneous emission and spontaneous emission intensity, okay? So we measure the intensity as a function of wavelength. You can see that at 10 degree, this red line here, okay? So you can see that there is a bit of some changes. It's very difficult to follow, but there is a bit of changes here. And as you increase the angle, that, uh, that the decrease of emission is actually slowly shifting to the shorter wavelength. And at larger angles, like 30 degree, it, the emission come back to the normal because at 30 degree, the stop gap is almost moved away from your uh, spontaneous emission spectrum of the dye. So the, the dye does not, the emission, the emitted light does not feel any photonic crystal effects. But now, as you see that these effects are very, very feeble, okay? So it's not that exciting. So people in literature or in our community classify these, these samples are not good for uh, emission measurements. So in our photonic crystal business, these samples are classified as weak photonic crystal. Okay. The reason is it does not give you much changes in spontaneous emission intensity. Okay. But actually what we did, we looked at the sample. What was the problem? So if you look at a microscope image of the sample in slightly in a uh, helicopter view, we can see that the samples consist of domains. And you have a lot of, lot of cracks, which is uh, uh, shown with these yellow lines. And when you do this kind of measurement here, actually we are measuring from all these domains because here you are using a lens or everybody use a lens and you're focusing on sample with the beam spot is quite high, okay? So all the light which is emitted from your sample, the depth of the sample, it's all scattered by these unwanted things. Okay, the system is not perfect and the sample is coming to these kind of domains, okay? And it has also variation thickness across the domain. So then we thought maybe the sample may not be the problem. The problem may be our optical experiment, the way we look at the things. So we devise uh, techniques. Can we measure 
not only from the law the larger area can we go to a single domain for example at this place we can measure but now it is more uh, difficult in terms of optical experiments because we need to make custom built setups so we took up that challenge it was a dst sponsored project also so we build a setup what we call as micro reflectivity setup okay so we have a super continuum source which is expanded and focused to the sample which is placed on an xyz actuator and the sample the, the reflected light is taken from this one and sent it to a spectrometer now what is the beauty of this setup is we can measure the reflectivity from sample area as small as 5 or 10 micron okay so if you have a 10 by 10 micron square we can measure the sample uh, we can measure the reflectivity so we can go to this uh, single domain so here is a image of the sample which taken during the measurement so we have an in situ optical microscope we built and which is giving me that this is a sample surface and this is my laser spot this is an old image okay we have a better image i'm sorry for that and uh, you can see that the light is focused on a single domain okay so we can measure from single domain and other thing we have to be careful since we are doing a wide light spectroscopy we should uh, avoid the chromatic aberrations otherwise the different colors will focus a different place on the sample and that give microscopically wrong data but macroscopically correct data which many people publish and uh, so this is a special kind of objective, not a glass objective. It's a reflective objective where we avoid the chromatic dispersion. And as a technique, it's a very interesting uh, test uh, setup because we can measure signal from very, very, very small sample, okay? Even down to the 10 micro. So this, as an instrumentation paper, we publish in a review of scientific instruments and it's quite useful. Even people come to our lab uh, from you know, to measure signal from 2D material, these are moist two kind of samples because the samples are very very small uh, in the substrates to see how much light is reflecting by the system. Okay, so we measure the reflectivity using our own setup, the same sample which I shown you in the one slide back, and we you look at the blue curve here. We are getting now nearly 100% reflection of light, and why we get 100% because we, we, we are now looking within a small domain where there's no defects, there's no cracks. So we can call experimentally these are perfect system. Okay? So if you write in paper perfect system, the referee object it, but let's say the near perfect system. So we get nearly 100% reflection. And this is a selected data. All domains does not give 100%. Okay? And if you look at the conventional data, which you found in literature before our paper, it's all uh, give you around 50% reflection. Okay? The reason is because it was a macroscopic measurements and so like this uh, we have this very nice setup where we can ma manipulate the sample along the spatial directions so we pick as much as domain and we measure in the reflectivity spectrum so there are domains which are 100 percent there are domain which is 20 percent and so we uh, got these nice fabric borough kind of fringes and we estimate the thickness of the sample so as you can see that as you move from here to here the thickness is actually fluctuate so the sample thickness somewhere nine micron we end up to 18 micron. So these kind of nice features of the sample which actually washed away when you do a microscopic measurements. Okay, so it was more clever optical experiment which actually make the sample is quite interesting. And so this is very important for our work. Later, I'll come back to this thickness variation. So I, in the beginning, if you remember, I start that I show you a peacock feather measurement. This is done in our lab. Our campus is filled with the peacocks. And um, so you have huge peacocks around our house or labs. So yeah, this is one of the stem, okay? So you take a peacock and this is one layer. So this is an optical microscope picture. So you can see that this, what biologists call barbels. So barbels like this kind of bricks arranged like this. And you can see the size of one barbels is very, very small. It's maybe 20 or 30 microns. And this is a live image measurement from our lab. So we focus light here, the laser light in our experiment and measure the reflected. So you can measure different, different babbles, which give different, different colors. And you can see that the reflected actually changes the wavelength, the wavelength of reflect. So the peacock feather actually consists of many, many barbels, which uh, diffract different colors because of the underlying structure is different. Okay, so you can have nice, beautiful colorations. So we started this experiment on this biological system just for a fun or a Friday evening experiments. But now it's a very strong activity in our group because these samples actually quite interesting, which no lab can make if you look at the microstructure of these samples. Okay, so it's a very good system for many light matter and scattering studies. In fact, there is a nature paper recently that few days back 
they are talking about some butterfly shows black color and that is the the the, the strong the blackest material available in the world so it's very simple this kind of measure we can use to study those systems this was setup was so nice so as i said then we move to the emission measurements now as i said the, we looked at the reflectivity from single domain so we knew also need to measure the emission from a single domain so again we have to set up the experiments because we have to go to a very very small scale and we need to see where from where we are measuring it so we made a setup for emission measurements and uh, it took some time because uh, uh, it was tough uh, in the initially and we measured the light we excite with the 532 to nanometer light on a single domain and collect the emitted light from that single domain okay so here i am plotting the emission intensity as a function of wavelength so you can see that the black curve is a reference emission which is there is no photonic crystal it is a simple rhodamine b suspension but we used we can see that it's emit nicely at 600 uh, 595 nanometer and then we measure the emission from single domain this sample and the intensity you can see that the blue curve here now i am sure if you compare blue with the black you can really appreciate that wherever there supposed to be emission happen it actually drops because now the emission the emitter is emitting from inside the sample so it cannot emit the light and the red curve is from the macroscopic measurement which people reported and classified these are not good systems so in the field of photonic crystal business we uh, we talk with the uh, uh, intensity ratio where which is the the the, the, the uh, sample spectra divided by the reference spectra so the red one is for the what macroscopic measurements but the blue is what we are quite interested so you can see that nearly we get 60% suppression emission intensity ideally we should get 100% so that really shows even 60% sorry the even single domain is not an perfect thing okay there may be still some light is going here and there so but still actually shown to the community look the samples are quite interesting so if you do a little bit carefully the optical experiments so now the question is do the i do i get 60% always do every region of the sample show 60% the answer is no okay so we did uh, this kind of measurement at many 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 domains and then we plot the histogram okay so this uh, the top one where we are looking at the how much is the emission suppression i'm getting as a function of this along uh, how and how many domains basically how many events how many domains give me the suppression so you can see there are a large number of domains give around 60% suppression which is centered on here but there are domains which give even uh, very very less even just 30% or less than 40% suppression and you can see that there is a huge variation also in the suppression across the sample so whenever you know, people talk about how much suppression they got the question is is it uh, same at every place in the sample so one has to do a very very precise spatial dependent measurements and if i do the same measurement within a single domain that this measurement is across the sample and this measurement is within the single domain you can see that the distribution which is quite quite narrow and it's nearly on average we are getting around 55% suppression okay and you know, so when we look at this suppression uh, across this uh, sample the question is is it has some scaling or is it quite arbitrary in the sample so but it is not arbitrary what we found is that the suppression is actually scaled with a parameter l by lb so i shown in my introduction slide L is the thickness, L B is the Bragg length, and so as you increase the domain size, so you can see that the suppression is actually scales linearly with the sound system size, and we repeat this measurement for an another sample, and we could get the same kind of linear scaling with this uh, in the emissions. So then we found out quite earlier in somewhere in 2000 there was a paper in Optics Letters where like, numerically people calculated. the emission suppression as a function of layer number that exactly i'm talking here so they only calculated only for three layers uh, three samples which has three uh, number of layers is 3 5 and 7 and they get uh, as you increase the number of layers you get a very very strong suppression you must uh, you can notice that the wavelength they calculate is 10 to 15 micron maybe at that time they did not thought people can make it to the structures into half a micron scales that could be the reason why they looked at the uh, infrared ranges but what you can see that like what uh, they shown earlier we could actually prove that in fact look the emission is actually scales linearly with the system size okay it cannot go large like this because in real samples anyway disorder will come and kill all of your effort okay but 
we submitted these two optics results, but the um, one referee was quite rigid, and so editor also did not agree. The reason is it all looked fine, but if you want to really say the spontaneous emission scales with the system size, intensity is only a signature. Mm? So if you really want to show that, one has to do a decay rate measurement because the decay rate measurement directly related to the density of states in your systems. So we have to now do a time to solve measurement to find out what is the decay constant of the life, lifetime of the system. So we made those setups. So before going to the setups, so this is an important thing, okay? So the rate of emission now proportional to the density of states. So you can look at density of states like this, or we call it local L, uh, density of states because we are looking at um, uh, direction dependent. So you can see there are large ways for a photon to escape, okay? So like in a homogeneous medium, it can come in all directions. Whereas in uh, photonic crystal kind of systems where the density of states are reduced, I mean, this be some, it's not zero, but there is still is uh, very much minimum. So in nuclear physics, you have the decay, which take years, but in optics, quite things are very fast. It can happen in nanoseconds to picoseconds. So one need to do uh, to characterize that does really L dose or the dose scale in the system, we need to do a decay rate measurements to find out the lifetime of the, uh, the um, uh, these emitters. So we build a setup to do that. And this is a time resolved setup, which use a picosecond laser. And we again focus the light on a single domain and measure the, the lifetime. And basically we measure the decay curve and measure the uh, estimate the lifetime from this, uh, these samples. So this is our first data. So this, is, this shows intensity as a function of time. So earlier measurement, we are talking intensity as a function of wavelength which is a spontaneous emission intensity measurement. So here we are talking about the rate of emission, uh, rate of the spontaneous emission. The black curve, the black symbol is a reference emission, the reference sample, which shows a very nice single exponential decay and it's quite fast. So when you do within the band gap, which is a 600 nanometer, which is within the stop gap of your sample, you can see that the blue symbol, that the decay rate is actually slowed down, okay? And so compared to the SAM uh, reference, my photonic crystal is actually uh, reducing the decay rates. That means the lifetime is uh, increased, or that means the density of state is reduced at that frequency of that wavelength. But there are always uh, another school of thought that uh, this comparison is not correct. One should compare slightly a wavelength outside the gap. So we have a filter which do measurement close to the band edges. So this 570 nanometer, Mesh, uh, filter is just outside the gap wavelength. So if you do a measurement at 570, you can see that the decay rate is again um, faster compared to the uh, my uh, the gap wavelength. So one can say that, yes, the samples actually really show some um, a bit of change in the decay rate, but okay, so. Okay. in 70% separation, but lifetime does not show that much change. So the, from the single domain at 600 nanometer, the lifetime is 3.9 nanoseconds and outside the gap, it is 2.9 nanoseconds. So we got a one nanosecond difference in degrees in the lifetime. And if I compare with the suspension, which is the black curve, and this is 1.9 nanoseconds. Okay? So these are the average lifetime, which we estimated from by fitting these measurements, by doing a double exponential fit, following this paper um, uh, in some time back. Okay, so people use different fit also, but this is something which worked better for us. So, and where these values are also in agreement with the theoretical calculations so shown by others. So, similar to the emission me intensity measurement, the question is, does everywhere in your sample you get curve like this? Again, answer is no. So, if we measured um, uh, uh, the lifetime across the sample. So we, we measure from single, single domain. You can see that there are um, the red curve is at the gap wavelength. It actually lifetime increases. Okay? The lifetime increases from uh, somewhere here around uh, 3.7 or something nanosecond, and it move up to around 4.45, uh, sorry, for about just 4.4 nanoseconds. Whereas if you do the measurement at 570 nanometer, you can see that it nearly remains a constant, does not give much changes and, but there is some kind of increase because you have to be very careful here because 570 is very close to the bandage and filter as 10 nanometer, I think full width is the half maxima. 
so a bit of overlap to the gap. So that could be the reason why we get a bit of scaling here. Okay, so this clearly shows that when you do this kind of spontaneous emission measurement, not only on photonic emission, but any nanophotonic samples, one need to be very careful that how does it fluctuate across the sample surface. Okay, so we did many measurement on the sample. And uh, so we divide the sample measurement into squares. The outside region is the number one square and we take measurement as we move inside, okay? So there are 500 measurements, something we did and we plot the lifetime as a function of square number. So at 570, if you're measuring in the square one region, you see there is a quite bit higher lifetime compared to 570. And if you're an unlucky fellow, you do a measurement in the region fifth and you conclude that these samples are weak. And this is not because our measurements were not correct. Okay. So we had to really do a spatial dependent measurements in these kind of nanostructures so that the actual facts can be, uh, can be seen that the, the samples are really, really, it's not that photonically weak. It really shows changes in emission intensity and changes in emission rate. So similar to the intensity fluctuations, we have shown the, um, uh, the the uh, kind of um, uh, map where we uh, map the lifetime uh, across the measured across the sample. So this is the red color, red bars are for the gap wavelength and the green curve is for outside the gap, uh, which is 570 nanometer. So you can see that at some places, if you do measurement, there is an overlap, but at some places they have a very, very clear, distinct uh, changes in the lifetime compared to a wavelength outside. And if you do the measurement within a, um, single domain, they are nicely separated, okay? So you get a very high lifetime, around 4.5 nanosecond at the stop gap, and which is quite less um, um, in the 570 nanometer. So clearly you can see that the L dose is changed because the lifetime is changed. That is means the decay rate is changed using this equation because the decay rate is inversely proportional to lifetime. And if you um, now you plot the lifetime as a function of your system size, which we classify by L by LB, you can see that there is a linear scaling similar to the intensity measurement. So actually now this clearly shows, and this is kind of the first time we could prove that in uh, experimentally that the L dose in photonic crystal, the density of states in photonic crystal is not only depends on frequency and position, but it actually depends on your system size. Because if you do measurement here, you have a low density of states, uh, so suppression is quite less, but if you do it here, the suppression is quite larger. So we looked at theory and uh, there was earlier work by uh, one of the famous group in photonic crystal, uh, for the Noda group from Japan. So they also calculated, as you increase the number of layers, the normalized emission rate is actually decreases. But he says the gamma value decreases as you in, uh, increase the number of layers. That's what exactly we see here. When you say the gamma is decreasing, the lifetime should be increasing because it's inversely proportional lifetime. So when we are working on this experiment, there was a theoretical paper published in Physical Letters, exactly addressing the same problem that we are looking at it. And so they, they also shown that the density of states actually scales linearly with the system size. Okay, So there's a, um, we use L by LB, they use A by a, L because these are ideal samples that so they don't need to worry about the disorder or how much light attenuation or all. So they plot it in a by a. Okay. So this was uh, one of the nice contribution to the community from our group, and uh, and the take home message is that uh, in this part that in um, these kind of self assembled system can actually show a real suppression in spontaneous emission, which is proved by this um, decay rate measurements. Intensity is always show you suppression. Okay, but it's not the intensity that actually one has to look at. One has to look at the rate of the uh, spontaneous emission, and that will relate to the whether density of state is suppressed or not. And, and uh, across the sample, the, the lifetime is not just uh, arbitrary, it actually follows scaling with a um, L by LB, and it has a linear scaling. Whereas at uh, 570 nanometer, you don't see any kind of scaling. You can see that at the gap wavelength, it actually nicely shows scaling, but then outside- uh, Rajesh, wavelength... there is a question. Yeah. Uh, um... Dinesh, you go ahead and ask the question. Hey, Rajesh, uh, when you are saying that the local density of states plays the role in the spontaneous emission rate, and uh, we are showing this uh, lifetimes, uh, do we correlate them with any kind of absolute PLQI measurements? No, we uh, we don't do. We we just look at the uh, the decay rate measurement only. So it it actually saying that the PL count is decreasing. Mm, yes. 
and uh, but that is not not connected with the uh, like kr plus kn are sub, uh, combined by plqy kind of experiment no 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 this is simple spontaneous emission degrade it simply says that the the emitter cannot emit at that frequency okay so it's a degrade is slow down so it's a perfect system it cannot emit then what happened to the system is an open problem okay so, so i have a quick, small question yeah. so this uh, saturation is it related to what dinesh was asking that there is not full relaxation but after that there is some kind of a set so this yeah which one you know so, so in that first plot you see it goes from order 1 to 10 to the power minus 3 so there is that much decay but then it saturates yeah it's such a because there is no more emission so all the excited no emitter came yeah. down it's all all means all emitted and that's why yeah. it saturate okay. yeah okay. so uh, we published this in optics letters uh, last year and uh, and a full length article of the whole details calculation everything is now probably will be accepted today or tomorrow because editor has to take a decision and we got a very good comment so it is uh, accepted as it is i can say okay so um, so till this moment i was talking to you about ordered structure right i i did not like the disorder okay i was always looking for a perfect region on the samples but later we thought disorder also can show you some interesting things and the disorder what we are talking is not the conventional random photonic structures okay so i'll tell you what we mean by that but before just to conclude what we are looking till now is ordered nanophotonics or ordered photonic system where we have interested periodic variation dielectric constant what matters is the bragg scattering and the length scale is bragg length and it is interesting to show band gap and spontaneous emission separations but when you go to a disordered photonic system you don't have a periodic variation rather you have a random variation of dielectric constant so it is a random and instead of bragg scattering what you have is mostly multiple scattering of light so there is no preferred direction of scattering and the bragg length will replace with the scattering mean free path the average distance between scattering and the interesting phenomena that people look for study in this as random lasers and it was more exciting for optics uh, that it was a system proposed as anderson lock laser system for light because it, if it is possible for electron it should be possible for light also so what we have till now is a kind of a perfect system very nicely ordered sample so i want to make it completely random okay i want to make it disorder okay so it's very difficult because if you if you want to make a disorder 100 times you make a disorder it is a 100 type of disorder in order you have some control but disorder is always disorder and what is important to note here that our scatterers that individual these scatterers are mono dispersed okay so it's not like a powder sample or a chalk or a milk or anything it's, it's a really mono dispersed scatter okay so we have to make the structure from out of the perfect system okay we'll i'll show you how we do that and it was quite interesting in the last 5 6 years and you can see a lot of papers are written this can, nice process these kind of samples can be seen and if you look at the literature actually this again go back to the initial slide which i shown you by cv raman has shown it so people nowadays again back to those uh, days looking at uh, how birds many natural system show colors and they try to what's called bio inspired system they try to mimic in the la laboratory so they made these kind of scatterers there are uh, very less number of scatterers 30% you increase the scatter size and you become kind of a correlated then correlated structure what do you mean by correlated that the scatters are touching each other and this can also show some interesting things that calculate structure factor and if there is a peak in structure factor there should be some resonance scattering like a, one should get some kind of diffraction in the process so the question is can we make this sample in lab can we study these are all theoretical work and you can see that all is published in a very good journal so it was in the last few years and we also did something in this direction a few years back which i am not going to discuss today but we will show you something which is very fresh from the sea because it's not even published so we take up this one before i go into my work i'll uh, those who are not familiar with this thing i use some numbers in my talk so as as i said the disordered medium is a random so, variation uh, yeah. sorry rajesh you have around uh, 6 to 7 minutes yeah okay okay so Thanks. okay so um, you have this uh, disordered system where the light is multiply scattered so we have two length scale one is scattering mean free path the distance between two scattering uh, two scatterers and there is a transport mean free path which is the light get completely random and if you measure the transmission as a function of thickness of the sample, it actually shows the drop in transmission. It's like a photonic Ohm's law. Okay, and this is something which proved in the lab I mentioned. 
So these are quite simple old measurements that most of the people work in free optics knows. And so we have these photonic samples. So we did some kind of chemistry following this paper where you ordering is disturbed by addition of an electrolyte and we can make disorder structure, okay? So we can make a different level of order plus disorder or completely disordered. But what was interesting is that when you have a completely disordered sample, and if you look, really look at the same picture, the, uh, these scatterers are touching each other, okay? It's not isolated. They form some kind of clustering, okay? And within that one cluster, there is a small short range order, okay? So, so we take up this picture and we look at the pair correlation function. So we can say a bit of oscillations up to a one or one and a half micron that clearly shows there is a bit of ordering within this disorder in the samples. So actually what we are looking is a photonic structure, which has a short range order in a strong mm, mm, uh, disordered background, okay? So this is some system, this is a system what people are looking theoretically. Can we uh, look at, make the structure experimentally and look at whether it can give, since it is a short range order, can it give a, a gap like this? So since we are talking about disorder sample, we need to measure what is called total transmission measurements, where the light is reflected in all directions and the transmitter also in all directions. So we collect the light, the total transmission as a function of frequency or the wavelength. And for a normal disorder sample, like a powder sample, you don't get, you get the normal Rayleigh type uh, thing that is the transmission decreases with the wavelength. But when we did for our sample, what you see is quite interesting. And instead of having a decrease in transmission, it also has a drop in transmission around 650 nanometer. And if I make a long range ordered sample using the same scatterers, PS287, polystyrene 287 nanometer size, and I measure the same spectra, you can see there is a gap and it actually coincides. So this gap originated due to the long range ordering in the photonic system, and this gap is originated due to the short range order in the system. And to prove that it actually works, we devise a scattering model following the work early by Ascordon, uh, the Ascordon Mermin data scott in 67, and the recent paper in, um, by from Howard group, where they also try to look at this in terms of why colors are occurring many, many birds. And so we use this formula, which can be related to our sample. And the D is the sample size, the scatter size, and Y0 is a parameter which you get from the structure factor calculation. So we calculate the structure factor following the theory in this paper, and we estimate the lambda gap and plot it as it, so it shows the red line is the calculation, our calculation and the symbols are our measurements. You can see that from around 300 nanometer to 1,800 nanometer. So we could tune actually. So it actually shows a linear increase in the gap wave. So remember this gap, what we are talking is a short range order gap. Okay? So this is kind of a first time we could show that and uh, that this can really uh, uh, happens in experiments. And we try to we try to analyze with the theory. So maybe the time is less, so I'll just flash it. Uh, so we apply the diffusion approximation because there is a strong background scattering, and we measure the um, lambda gap and also the transmissions. So you can see that the measure transmission actually decrease as you increase the system size. And so we apply the diffusion approximation to get the scattering length scales like a scattering mean free path, a transport mean free path, and that is related to a parameter called the anisotropy scattering, which is a G values. Okay, so, so I'll just show you that we fit the diffusion approximation to our measurements and we estimate the scattering length scales, and this is a plot. So LT value, the transport mean free path actually decreases and it show a nice drop where we get our gap as expected and it's come back. And the LS is also show a kind of decrease at the gap. And we did another experiment to prove that, yes, the approximation value what we're getting is correct. So we also did a current backscattering quantum to measure transport mean free. So it actually matched with the, what exactly we are expecting. Okay, so we, now you can see that the variation of LT, which is a simple, we draw a, show a drop, where exactly the peak in structure factor calculation shows. So it clearly shows that the short range order samples has um, kind of a correlation among scatters that, that, that scattering co uh, correlation is actually give a gap. And so we today, um, we got the comments from the physical letters and uh, hopefully it will work. Okay, so today morning we received the comments and you know, probably it will publish in PRL. So there was some criticism, but hopefully it will work. And so we could show for the first time that, that if you properly tune the sample in the short range order samples, we can get this gap similar to a long range system and for uh, people working in scattering, 
this system can also give what is called a negative anisotropic anisotropic scattering. Okay, so since because of time, I could not spend much time on that. So uh, this negative scattering is actually an inclination towards uh, Anderson localization for photons. So probably this system will uh, properly tuned in terms of refractive index will be a kind of a test bench to look into Anderson localization of photons. And uh, how much time I have more? So I think if you can finish in a minute right. or so. So then I, I'm sorry, I maybe some other time I'll talk about our quantum photonics thing, um, uh, which is quite interesting. So okay, so um, I'll come to conclusion. So probably uh, I could give you some idea about the interesting things about this uh, is simple photonic systems, uh, what this photonic is still, what can they can, what they can do. And uh, if you properly tune the system, right? So like a short range or sample, we can also get similar to the gap features. And uh, we also proved this gap because if there is a frequency gap, the, the density of state should reduce. That's the meaning of the gap. And we did the experiment like similar to this and we confirm it experimentally. So these are the main papers in the last five years from our group uh, by different students. So uh, many areas, uh, so I only covered two papers. So probably uh, some other occasion I'll talk about it. And so I thank my students and uh, my first student who graduated last, uh, last year. And these are the present students. And um, um, thank all the funding agencies who being an expenditure and need a lot of money give me generous finance support and my collaborators. And we are also part of the National Initiative on Quantum Enabled Science and Technology, where we are using uh, NV centers in diamond to do single photon generations and then coupling that to photonic structures and see how we can enhance the rate of this spontaneous emission. Okay, so now for some students who are uh, watching this, we have vacancy our group and we have immediate postdoc vacancy, fully funded for three years. Uh, in the area of quantum photonics. If some of you are interested, please uh, write to me. And um, thank you for your time. And this is the view of our campus from the gate. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Ajay. That was very nice and uh, overview. So we could uh, take a few more questions if there is. Yeah. So can I ask? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, Rajesh, of course, I am not from exactly from your field. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sure. So please go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just uh, comparing the electronic band structure and things like that and the photonic thing that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, because we know that uh, in the electronic case now, this fashionable thing is topological insulators and uh, those kind of things. So yeah. do you have a counterpart here? Yeah, that is another active area of research, what is called photonic topological insulator. I see. Okay. And in fact, uh, we are talking with the Professor Renjan Singh from NTU Singapore. Okay. So he's recently had a paper on nature photonics on uh, photological, uh, topological photonic insulators, where they talk about eight states and uh, defect-free propagation and such things. So he's interested to couple NV centers with that. So yes, yes, there is a count, lot of interest I in see. that also. Okay. But I do not know anything about that field. But uh, yes, it's a very active field. Okay. Any other question? So then I have a, a small one. Yeah. So you mentioned about this disorder physics, yeah. but uh, this disorder is a structural disorder, if I understand correctly. Correct. Right? correct. And then locally they are correlated in a sense. They are locally, locally they are there correlated. Is, yeah, correct. Uh, there is order. So can one think about then locally there are quantum dots, and then these quantum dots mm -hmm. are kind of uh, uh, randomly spaced. Is is this a right picture to think about? Yeah, one can look at the quantum dot, but the problem is quantum dot size, you're talking over 10 nanometer something. Yes. So here, what we need is a scatter size is half a micron. Mm -hmm. So then all it comes to the optical domain. Okay. Because in most of the case, X-rays, you can't have X-ray photonic crystals because the refractive index nearly unity at X-ray wavelengths. Right, right. And so. Okay. But what is the goal? Means you, Anderson localization in photons has been observed, as you mentioned, uh, also. It was mentioned, as you see, if, whenever you have a climb on Anderson localization to PRL or nature photonics, you mm -hmm. can see counter argument immediately come. So the okay. question is, uh, how do you distinguish localization from absorption? 
Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. So it is still a debatable when people claim that it is absurd in 3D systems. And there are another group of people that don't agree with that. I see. Okay. So when, and, when you say, sorry, uh, when you say uh, localization, you really mean like quantum interference effects plays role rather than just no, a no. trap. We still, it is a classical interference. Uh -huh. Okay. The, uh, so you have a sufficient scattering strength. Okay. Okay. So the light which is propagating inside has a interfere with the counter propagating light. So it's kind of an interference within the system. Okay. So it forms a localized state in this system. So how much you can localize the localization length, it depends mm -hmm. on how, how you well you prepare your medium. Okay. okay. So the whole, whole question is that in theoretically you took look for a parameter, the wave vector multiplied by the transport mean free path, LT. Okay. So KLT should be equal to one. That means LT is equal to order of lambda. So you get a M interference condition. Okay, I think uh, as there is no immediate question, let me again thank uh, Professor Naya for this excellent talk and for accepting our invitation for this yeah. online seminar. Thank you for this opportunity. See you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you also all for joining. Yeah.